uh, the last, last week's lecture <clears throat> could have been titled The Islamic City in History. But in the larger context of this course, uh, we want you to embrace this material not simply as this content, this Islamic city in history, but as a larger, uh, something much larger, as a method for understanding cities. The real topic uh, that we're using, the title is the city as an organism. And the city as an organism is a topic that is getting at this uh, issue of how the world isn't always the product of specific design intention. Um, some of you, are, one or two of you, are going to end up going to uh, a graduate program in planning. And when you sit down in your planning program, your instructors are going to speak as if there is no urban form other than the urban form that comes out of design. And when that happens, you should be highly skeptical, and when you get up the courage, you should point out to that professor that that is just not true. Some cities take shape uh, as the result of distributed forces, not some old white guy planning it out, putting it down in a map, and then building it. Um, and so that's a fundamental weakness of planning schools, is they tend to not acknowledge the reality of the world out the window. They only see um, great white man plans, uh, and everything else is just nature or something like that. And the whole point of studying the Islamic city is there, as far as we know, there is no clearer demonstration of a highly codified system of rules that results inevitably in very specific urban forms and a very rich patterning that uh, is unpredictable in terms of its larger outcomes, highly predictable, absolutely rigidly locked into a certain set of rules. Um, uh, that, uh, so it's a very, very interesting case whether or not you're interested in the forms of the Islamic city, it is a fundamental phenomena of architectural design, the way form emerges out of the operation of forces. Um, you may find yourself in the design studio taking photographs of air bubbles uh, coming through uh, wax or something and looking at those patterns as a source of form for your architectural designs. That's emergent form. It is something that we architects do. It's been happening since forever in uh, manifesting as cities. So please don't just think of that last week's topic as Islam and its urban forms. Think of it as a much larger category of form making, which is emergence. And it's a hot topic in design lately, in the last few decades. Um, OK. Before we turn our attention to Professor Khodor, uh, please close your laptops unless you are taking notes on the lecture. Thank you. So today we're going to be dealing with city as machine. And this is kind of the antithesis, more or less, but not really the antithesis, to what we talked about as the city as an organism. Here we're going to see cases where cities are beginning to be planned and actually structured. And the whole idea behind this we need to keep at the back of our minds is that there's the concept that the landscape is seen as unruly and barbaric and uncivilized and that the form with which cities take and which we're going to see uh, in these examples such as Greek urbanism, Roman urbanism in the US operating system is that there is an attempt to civilize and regulate the landscape quite contrary to what we saw last week where cities are sort of more organic in their nature and have a different set of rules that are dictating their organization. So the first question that we start off is when is a map more than just a record of the territory? When is a map actually you know, indicating of a kind of specific design strategy, which again is informing a specific kind of urban form? 
And to begin, today's lecture, we're going to talk about these three things, starting with Greek urbanism. And now we're going to, you know, widen the timeline. Today, we're going to try to cover around 2,500 years of history, but in different sections. So when we talk about Greek urbanism, we have to keep at the back of our minds that this is happening somewhere between 1150 BC, BCE, which is, you know, 3,150 years ago, up until around 330 BC, which is about the time where Alexander the Great rises and conquers the world and does all of this stuff. So, to start, we need to look at what Greece is the nation, the modern nation state of Greece, and then what Greece is in the historical sense. Greece is, you know, a, a very irregularly shaped country on the Mediterranean. It's composed of thousands of islands and peninsulas and bays, and is primarily bisected by these very large and very intimidating landscapes, most of which are mountains, very forested, very fertile mountains. And from this, the original inhabitants of Greece start to develop an idea of the idyllic landscape and situating their temples, their places of worship, their cities, and their urban fabrics within this landscape and how they react to it. Again, you know, perfect destination. A lot of people go to Greece. It's a wonderful place. I encourage you to go if you've never been. But when you go, think about this relationship between townscape, cityscape, landscape, and religious and formal centers. There's the idea of building the temples in the landscape and how temples have to have a specific spiritual and uh, aesthetic relationship with the, the general landscape around it. This is one of the most important temples, the Oracle at Delphi, where many uh, uh, premonitions and omens and different kinds of uh, spiritual you know, things have happened and taken place, especially when it came to, you know, conquests, because the Greeks, by the time that their civilization rises to great power around two and a half thousand years ago, they developed this idea that whenever you need to go for a conquest, and this is actually a very old conquest. It doesn't happen at the time of the Greeks. It comes along much, much earlier. We're going to talk about it extensively next week with the city as cosmos. The relationship to the establishment of cities, to the conquest of cities, and to the conquest of other empires, and how all of that is tied to the spiritual realm, and to the realm of what is not seen. Now, this temple functions uh, on the scale of the entirety of the Greek city-states, and we're going to talk about the city-states in a little bit, but the whole idea behind it was that if somebody would seek, uh, would want to seek advice on a conquest or on establishing a city or on uh, delivering some kind of trade, they would come to this oracle where a woman uh, who was the high priestess of this oracle would give them a premonition. Now, as it turns out, this temple was built on top of a frisher in the land, which actually uh, exists above an underground uh, water reservoir, which was seeping methane and ethylene into the temple. So in reality, all of these hallucinations and hypnotic kinds of uh, experiences happened because the priestess herself and everybody who visited her got high because of, you know, the gases that were coming out of the ground. But again, you know, ancient cultures using some of the elements that they did not understand about the natural landscape around them in order to perpetuate a sense of understanding. Now, if we go to the height of Greek power, which is around 550 BC, we see that, and the Greek um, uh, civilization is represented in blue, we can see that there is this need to establish all of these colonies along the coastline of the Mediterranean. And because the Mediterranean was the most, you know, uh, populous and at the same sense urbanized area in the world at this time, and this is like a very large stretch because we're going to see in a, in a couple of slides ahead that there actually existed other civilizations, but we tend to focus on the Mediterranean because, you know, Europeans and white people and everything. So, 
let's not lie to ourselves. <laughs> so at, in 550 BC, we have two main civilizations that are controlling the Mediterranean trade. The Phoenicians, my people, and then the Greeks, who are happening over here. And the way that these uh, trade outposts would work is that, OK, you would find a place on the other side of the Mediterranean where you would find some sort of uh, resource that you would need, such as tin or copper or metals of any kind, crops, and you would actually go with you know a few hundred boats full of people and you would establish all of these colonies. The Phoenicians be started to do this and the Greeks picked it up because they found that their system was actually more effective at founding cities in the landscape. And then the Phoenician Empire collapses later on and, and you know, History is what it is. But what comes with this idea of establishing cities is the concept that is extremely important is the creation of the koine and the oikos. And the koine refers to the common or that which is public, and the oikos refers to that which is private. And both of these are the key elements that make up a polis. And the polis is the Greek word for city. So essentially, the characterization of what a city is comes from the designation of a public space where people share all of this space and it is a space that is open to all and is open to you know, all kinds of uh, activities, marketplaces, uh, uh, theaters, all of this stuff. And then there's a designation of a private space. Now, when it comes to the actual fabric itself, and we have to look in this specific case at the largest and the most important of the city-states, which is Athens, we see that very much represented in how the fabric of the city functions at the height of Greek power. You have on the tallest hill surrounding the main city, the Acropolis, which is the main spiritual center of the city. It is where the largest temples are dedicated. It is where all the processions happen. And then directly at the foot of that Acropolis, you have the Agora. And then the agora is the space of that koine, or the space of the common, or the space of the public. And surrounding the agora, which is essentially like a large, you know, empty public square, are all of these public buildings that start to spring up and create this kind of regularized fabric. Now, this still doesn't become a system that is applied worldwide, but this is sort of um, the height of what pre-urban urban cultures had as elements in their cities. Spiritual center, generally in the middle of the city, which is linked to the cosmos at a high point on a mountaintop, and we'll talk about that more extensively next week. And then immediately next to that, you have the center of public life. Surrounding that center of public life is where people lived. This is the, the Parthenon, which is, you know, the main temple on the top of the Acropolis, the main spiritual center of Athens. This is how it's located in the city today, on an outcrop of a rock in the middle of it. And, the re and really, the founding of Athens is very much linked to this hill. And this is the same thing that we're going to see in Rome and we're going to see in many other cities, especially when we talk about next week's lecture, is that the foundation of all of these ancient megacenters would happen around these spiritual high points. In addition to the Parthenon, we have the theater, another example of a public space that becomes part of the realm of the koine. You have, you know, the development of the theater, plays are being written. Um, uh, I just lost my trail of thought. But <laughs> architecturally, uh, the way the theater is designed in the Greek sense, and we're going to see an example of a Roman theater, which is quite different in the way that it's organized, is that it is set in the landscape. It does not attempt to modify the landscape to the degree that you no longer see it but it is set within it, and it always has a vista to the landscape. So that whenever you are, hello, so that whenever you are in the theater, you always have this connection between the space of culture, the space of the public, and then the landscape, which is still perceived as being, you know, this very 
rosy mythological kind of entity that is very important to the establishment of the city. Now, if we go further into the Agora, and we look more at the structures that surround these public spaces, we have, of course, the temples, which are happening in the middle, and they're all dedicated to these different gods, each of which provides some form of uh, sanctuary to its followers. And then alongside of it, we have the creation of the stoas. And the stoas are, are these public buildings where people can go, lounge, sit down, and have conversations, pretty much around this central space. But then the development of something else that comes to mind, which is going to become more important in the Roman context, is the typology of the basilica. And the basilica was first imagined as, you know, this also this very large internalized space, which is very porous to the public, but is where the main debates in the city actually occurred. So people would meet at the basilica, the politicians of the city would meet at the basilica, they would talk about their, their issues, they would discuss what they needed to do, they would discuss uh, philosophy, they would discuss mathematics, they would discuss all sorts of, uh, all sorts of, you know, the talk of the time. Porous is private, right? Porous is, uh, no, it's more public because it allows for, um, <coughs> I'm missing the English term for permeability. it. Permeability. Permeability, thank you. you. Know, so a screen of columns will allow people to walk through the columns that's more porous. Yeah. This is an aerial view of that same agora today. They reconstructed one of the stoas to what is believed to be its original form over here, but then they kept the rest of them as ruins so you could see the dynamics and the difference. Now, what comes out of this concept of creating a public space and designating a space as private is the idea that you need to regularize the landscape to the greatest degree. And this be first becomes extremely exemplified in these two examples. There's Piraeus in Turkey, um, if I'm not mistaken, is what this is. And then there's Miletus, which is on, an, on a peninsula in Greece. And if you look at the way that the city is laid out, you can immediately see this need to regularize the landscape. It is structured according to a grid. There's a series of main roads that bisect the city in the center. All of the public entities are placed, the agora, the marketplaces, the, the main temples, the largest religious centers. The theater is placed over here in a sense where it can overlook both the sea and these large public buildings, again, linking the space of culture to the landscape and to the space of, you know, the urban common ground. Miletus is surrounded by a wall. It wasn't enough to create defenses that, are only, that only seal the city off from the land. You also needed to seal it off from the sea to prevent from a naval attack. And then there's a harbor, of course, which acts as the economic center. So if you look at it, economic center, public center, cultural center surrounded by these extremely regularized gridded blocks. This is a view of the theater of, this is one of the theaters of Miletus, not the one that's next to the sea. That one happens further back over there. But again, you know, the space of culture is set within the landscape, allowing a vista towards the mountains, towards the rest of the city, and towards the main public spaces that surround it. This is another city founded by the Greeks in Turkey. We had seen the colonies had started moving from the Greek islands into <coughs> Asia Minor. And with that, they took this urban fabric with them. This is Pirene, and then, again, main axes, surrounded by an irregularly shaped wall for protection, the location of all the major public spaces in the middle, the agora, the temples, the markets, and then right on the top of the mountain that surrounds the city is the Acropolis. <coughs> Again, the spiritual center linking the city to the cosmos. Here's a more detailed plan. Stadium, gymnasium, markets, stoas, 
theaters at the base of the mountain so you can overlook the city, the public spaces, and the landscape. Main temples, and then all of these are the residential quarters existing within these extremely gridded and structured zones. An artistic rendition of what the city would have looked like in its day. Now, we move a few hundred years later to the, to the Roman urbanism. The Greeks sort of start off this, um, I don't want to call it a policy, but this sort of... Uh, practice? Practice, thank you. Yeah, I'm not, uh, the language center in my brain is not working today. Mm -hmm. The Greeks start off this practice of applying all of these very uh, regularized kind of urban forms all over the colonies that they establish. But the culture that really takes this to a totally different level is the Roman Empire. And here, you know, when we talk about the Roman Empire, we need to talk, of course, about Rome, which is the center of that empire, which was at that time, and by the time that Rome grew to become the greatness that it became, was actually a very irregularly shaped city. There was almost no planning that had gone into Rome at this point. The first instances of Roman planning happened in the Forum around 300 to 400, uh, 300 to 400 BC, up until 300 to 400 AD. But again, we have a city that is established on seven hills. It has a very distinct kind of legend myth that comes with its establishment. We're going to talk about it next week. And then the city sort of exists in the interstitial space between the hills. The hills are designated as these holy zones, on top of which temples and large public structures are built. And this is a plan of more or less what the ancient city would have looked like with its succession of walls. At some point, Rome had seven series of walls because it grew to be one of the largest cities at the time. At the height of the Roman Empire, almost one million people lived here. So wall number one, wall number two, wall number three. Again, the more the city expands organically, the more these walls are built to contain it. If we go into the forum, we realize that in terms of organization, it's more or less like the Greek agora. Now, of course, the, Ro the Romans develop a series of typologies that are very, very different from the Greek ones, which they apply onto the urban fabric. But these don't come as an overall design strategy. More or less, they're kinds of like islands that are plugged into the city. And you get all of these very interesting moments where, for example, along these streets where shops are located, you suddenly find yourself in the middle of a gigantic basilica or a gigantic public building, which is awkwardly positioned. Because at this time, the Romans have not yet applied a large regularizing strategy to the city itself. And in that sense, they actually couldn't because they had so much that they already needed to deal with. But the real invention that comes with Rome's urbanism, and we're going to see that in a bit, is actually how Rome applies the civilizational strategy to other cities and other contexts because of this perception that anybody that is not Roman is hence uncivilized. And this is kind of the basis of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to throw that out there. But that, of course, comes with much, much more nuanced, uh, much more nuanced issues. Now, again, we have a highly irregularly shaped urban fabric in the center of the city, surrounded by these massive public buildings, these very large basilicas, temples. You have the Colosseum, which is another kind of theater, which, gonna, which we're going to talk about in a bit. And you have also the stadiums and the gymnasiums and the baths. The Romans developed the typology of the bath. We compare it to Miletus which is much more structured because this is a founded and designed city. Rome is not a designed city. But then the concepts of urban design in the Roman context become much clearer. From Vitruvius, we have this plan, which basically says, you know, you build 
a wall around the city. The interior of the city is structured along these two very main axes, the Cardo and the Decumanus. And almost every single Roman city that has ever been founded in the world will have a Cardo and a Decumanus, and you can read those in the fabric of cities today sometimes, if they've kept their plans. Um, cities that have been founded by the Romans and by other ancient cultures tend to actually keep their plans in that sense, because when you apply uh, the notion of creating a public space inside of a city, and that public space is represented by a street, that street tends to stay where it is all throughout time. But again, to go back to the organizational method, Cardo, de Cumanus, they meet in the middle. Wherever they meet, you locate all of the public structures and the large temples and the large theaters and all of the things that are meant to consolidate people into the center of the city as a part of public life. And then beyond it, you would have the residential quarters. But again, bound by a wall, for protection, bisected by these roads, and these roads continue on further. And this is also part of the ingenuity of the Roman Empire, is that the, cre is the creation of the Roman road network. I'll elaborate on that in a bit. And here we have a plan from Silster, I believe is, is how it's oh, yeah. uh, read. Yeah. Silster. Silster. Again, this is a city in England right? And the Romans basically conquered England in the first century AD, but then they have started applying this regularizing strategy. They started founding these cities. They believed that the indigenous people, the indigenous Britons and Celts were barbarians and did not have large cities, so we'll give them cities, and that's going to make them less barbarian in that sense. But again, we look at the city, very clearly defined walls, Cardo, the Cumanos, around the Cardo and the De Cumanos, you have the big public structures, and then the farther out you go from there, you have the residential buildings located along to the sides. And the way that the Romans begin to found these cities and structure them is actually quite ingenious. They have this device whose name is escaping me, do you remember? Um, well, these guys are called centurions because mm -hmm. they are centurionizing the landscape. Centurionizing. But, um, which probably isn't a real word, but it's based on divisions by tens and hundreds. It's establishing the grid. Mm -hmm. And so these people come in when there's a military order to establish a city or a camp in a certain place and they have this device and they basically stand and they use it to lay out the Cardos Maximus and the Decumanus Maximus, which are the largest streets, yes? So would they be considered like the old time surveyors? Yeah, exactly. More or less, more or less, yeah. The old time surveyors and the old time planners. And using these devices, and they would have spotters on the other side with these strings and they would use that to actually lay out the grid of the city. Now, in addition to the founding of the cities, the Romans also found camps. And we talked about camps extensively earlier on in this semester as these military outposts that exist within the landscape, but act as these stopping points for this mission civilisatrice, which is also something that I'm going to be referring to later on. Now, in colonial times, and I'm going to fast forward very briefly, 2,000 years into the future, there is the French concept of the mission civilisatrice. Can you guess what that means? Mission of the civilization. <laughs> That's a good guess. Oh. The civilizing mission. Because oh. French, you... Oh. <laughs> Some of you speak French. Barely. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the civilizing mission is an idea that any fabric or group or people or even um, race or religion that is not founded upon specific principles that dictate how their lives must be structured through their presence in cities need to be civilized. And the Romans take 
actually pioneer this idea in, in the very beginning. The Greeks develop it earlier on by saying, okay, we need to regularize the landscape, but it is the Romans that bring this idea and they make it a very widespread phenomenon by saying, wherever we are present in the very wide and far reaches of our empire, we need to plug in these camps and these cities that follow this distinct order in order for the people that live in these cities to be considered as civilized. And in the, even in the far reaches of the Roman Empire, whenever they would happen upon a piece of land where people did not follow or did not accept this kind of urban fabric, they were immediately characterized as barbarians. And this was a plan that was implemented by force. This didn't come as part of, you know, a, a very... Uh, International development aid. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not like USAID or some sort of, you know, money... Uh, uh, money in economic injection into a city. This happened out of military conquest and the need to create these axes and these very specific city forms was all about military conquest. It was all about saying here, this is Rome, this is civilization, this is how we live. And if you don't follow this living plan, then you are not Roman, you are not civilized. Now, the Romans were expert engineers, and when it came down to the details of how they structured their urban fabrics, they pioneered several very important elements that we still use today. The creation of sidewalks, the creation of crosswalks, because uh, the idea was that in a Roman city, the space that would flood during heavy rain was actually the streets. So you had an elevated walkway on either side, which eventually becomes the sidewalk, and then the crosswalk would actually be also an elevated series of rocks for people to walk across. They developed sewage systems in order to move uh, sewage from the homes, from the streets, rainwater, outside of the cities. This is an example, I believe this is in Pompeii. I don't know. Looks like Pompeii. They developed aqueducts to ship water from the landscape into the city. Massive, massive structures that bisected the landscape, bisected cityscapes, all to bring water from the tops of the mountain or from the wells down to the cities which were generally located in the valleys. Mills and more aqueducts. And then finally, the roads. And this is one of the most important things that we're gonna talk about because it not only filters in Roman urbanism, but the development of the road and the development of transportation is actually something that we're gonna to touch upon when we get to Chicago later on in this lecture. You've all heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome, right? There's a very specific reason why that phrase exists. Alongside the civilizing mission which saw the establishment of hundreds and hundreds of cities throughout Europe and the Mediterranean world, there came this idea that all of these cities needed to be linked with a certain kind of transportation device, and that device was the road. So they built this massive road network that spanned what is known as the old world and really connected every single major urban center directly to the city of Rome. Now this is, you know, to widen the perspective, we have the Roman civilization happening here, but then on the other side of the world, you have many other different kinds of civilizations that are more or less doing the same thing, but in different configurations. And there's trade between these different um, systems. So there's a Chinese system uh, that is spreading across the continent of Asia, uh, there's an Indian system, a Persian system, uh, and these systems were in touch with each other through trade networks. Mm -hmm. Up until Rome declared war on the Persian Empire, but that happens, yeah. <laughs> but that happens later. But it's then again... trade war. They put a tariff on their steel. No. Really? No. Well, now they do, but... Just connecting to the present day. But again, you had the old Silk Road, and what was the old Silk Road doing? It was moving all sorts of trade from the Far East, through Central Asia, through primarily Constantinople, all the way to Rome. Those were the two main connections. China and its massive cities, and Rome. Silk became all the rage. 
and uh, to the point where the religions had to admonish people not to wear silk because it was too revealing of the human form. The things people do for God, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, now we're going to look at Rome itself very briefly. We can see the aqueducts over here bringing water from the tops of the hills right to the center of the city. You have the space of theater or the space of uh, entertainment, which is the Colosseum. You have the stadiums, which are also spaces of entertainment. And you have all of these massive temple complexes and large public buildings that exist square in the center of the city. And all of these are happening between these large spiritual hills. Right? There's the Palatine Hill over there, then there's the Capitol Hill somewhere down here, but, and then there's this hill. But again, more or less, the same kind of organization as the Greeks, but this, is, this only exists in Rome itself. What's this slide? Okay. Can you guys see this, or? Is it too horrible of quality? Again, another view. Square in the center of the city, you have the space of entertainment mm -hmm. and the space of not so long, not anymore culture, right? Because when we had seen the Greek theaters, it was a space of culture, a space where, you know, um, plays were being made and, and exhibitions were, not exhibitions, but people were broadcasting more or less a specific form of culture. In Roman times, this specific form of culture still exists, but gets pushed to the sidelines of the city, while in the center of the city you have the Colosseum. It becomes the space of entertainment, surrounded by the Forum, which is, you know, the Roman equivalent of the Agora, or the main public space. We have a plan of the forum. Again, basilicas take over from the stoas. They become the main spaces of discussion, the main spaces of meeting and greeting. And later on, they actually become the typology from which churches are designed after, when Christianity comes in a bit later, around 350 years later. Surrounding the basilicas, you have temples, you have atriums, you have bathhouses. And you have the Colosseum, of course. Again, just by reading these, you can sort of get an idea of all the programs that were plugged into this public space. Tabulariums, basilicas, markets. Now, the first attempt to really regularize Rome comes around 1,200 years from what we, we were speaking back then, which was the attempt by Pope Sixtus V to cut these axes in the city. And these axes come as a result of you know, the need to create a space of pilgrimage within the city so that people on Easter, for example, where there's a Catholic tradition of visiting seven churches in the city, they actually get to see all of these seven churches along the same axes. And the whole idea was consolidating these main landmarks within one single urban form, using the diagonal as that agency of that form. So we have you know, Piazza del Popolo being connected to Santa Maria Maggiore, which is somewhere over here, being connected to the Forum, which is here, being connected to all of these different elements that are making up the ancient religious fabric of Rome. And this is the first, probably the first large scale attempt to create these axes in the city of Rome itself. The Colosseum, smack in the center of the city, the space of entertainment, and the development of the Greek theater typology by completely removing the landscape. We had seen in the Greek examples that this wall didn't exist. The theaters were set in the landscape. There was a specific relationship between what could be seen and what could be experienced. In the Roman case, this is completely removed because theaters are you know, now expected to be turned up 
into themselves. And then there's the creation of the theater facade, where, the, where there's you know, a backstage and there's um, a designing of all of uh, the performances that actually happen here in accordance with this facade. So the segregation of the landscape from the cultural space and then the closing off of that cultural space from the public space. This is a map of the Roman Empire and its large urban centers by the first century, the second century AD. You can see it's a massive empire. It spans almost all of the civilized world by then, but then it's called the civilized world because it's part of the Roman Empire. And because the Romans are planting all of these cities and camps and urban centers everywhere. And wherever they arrive to contexts such as the Middle East and such as Greece, where these urban centers had already existed, then the Romans initiated a restructuring of these urban fabrics by, again, creating a cardo, a decomanos, localizing large public structures around them, and then encasing all of these within a fortified wall. Now, one of the most um, illustrious examples of a Roman city is Timgad, which is located in present-day Algeria. You can tell by this artistic rendition, which probably has very little to do with what the city actually looked like, but we like to tell ourselves that these are accurate representations. You can already see the main um, components of a very well-developed Roman plan. Wall, cardo, comanos, public buildings, closed off theater, segregated from the landscape, placed in the center of the city, surrounding the agora, or the forum, as it is now known in the Roman case. We have the road network, and this is actually a very nice artistic rendition of what it means to say all roads lead to Rome. This is the current European road system, but it's been modified in the sense that all of the roads have been connected in a way that they branch out from the city of Rome. And most of these road networks, most of these large connections between cities are actually based on the Roman road network that was initially founded 2,000 years ago at least in the ones that are connecting Rome all the way up to Paris and to the large European capitals, most of which were actually started as Roman cities. So this is a video of how Rome first consolidated power and grew. <laughs> So if your eyes are on your screen, you're missing it. With this expansion that happens very quickly, it happens over a space of two to three hundred years, there is this entire strategy that comes with it, building the roads, building the bridges, building the aqueducts, and with those building of the cities, which initially start as camps, but then grow depending on their designation. And this is the height of the Roman Empire. After this, it collapses further on, and it becomes split, and then, you know, that's the end of Rome as we know it, at least in the ancient sense. And specifically in Britain, and I want to pause this video here, and no. Is there no way for me to forward this? I don't know. It doesn't seem like it. If it were playing on YouTube, it's playing on. Mm. <clears throat> but the you space bar do it? The space bar pauses. Oh yeah, okay. But I can't go forward. But it's fine. You sort of get the idea of how large, extensive, and massive this empire is. Yes? So, what do the different chains of rights have Very good question. Uh, different kinds of designations. So there's, first of all, 
each one of these is a military campaign in itself. But then with that military campaign, the new territory is consolidated in a different way. So in a sense, for example, you have what is now known as Italy, but is actually composed of many small city-states. That was consolidated pretty early, so that had a very specific kind of organizational strategy. When they start expanding into the Balkans and into Croatia and Serbia and Montenegro and Bosnia, which is this campaign, which was sponsored primarily by Diocletian, one of the Roman emperors, um, it becomes designated differently, right? It becomes a colony of Rome, rather than being part of the Italian homeland, which is Rome, right? This becomes another colony of Rome, which is the Alps. Southern France, or Gaul, becomes another colony of Rome. And then all of these regions, depending on how they're conquered and how they're consolidated into the Roman Empire, become different colonies and provinces. And then within these provinces, certain cities are chosen and designated as colonia, or the main large cities of each colony. And then from there, these become the cities that receive most of the infrastructural upgrades, most of the funding, most of the, you know, the construction of the roads and the big temples and all of that, because they're expected to keep the peace and to keep this civilizational mission over the lands within which they preside. In the case of um, Croatia, Bosnia, and Serbia, that city was split, which is over here. In the case of Spain, that city was Barcelona, right? These became the main urban centers. In the case of North Africa, that used to be the city of Carthage, which was destroyed by Rome. And Really, it was that campaign when Rome destroyed Carthage that actually allowed the Roman Empire to reach the extents that it did at that time. In Syria, they found Aleppo and they found Beirut as the main urban centers and the main regularizing centers. In Egypt, it was Alexandria, right? Each of these colors designates a province. Each of these provinces is ruled by a city, and that city sort of controls everything that happens. And keeps the wealth flowing back and keeps, to Rome. And keeps the wealth and the trade flowing back to Rome. Now, when they conquer Britain, <clears throat> eventually they get off so far up Scotland, and the Scots give them such a hard time because the Scots are not the kind of people that just accept. <laughs> somebody ruling over them, that they actually begin to build walls. So they build, there's an, there's an, un Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall is down here somewhere, but there's another one that's farther up north that was built by the Romans first, because they really perceived the people living here as barbarians. They're like, we don't want anything to do with these people, so we're just going to build a wall and have them stay there. Kind of like what Trump is doing today, if you think about it. But, you know, with with the same kind of racist undertones in that sense. And, um, but yeah, London, Gloucester, all of these cities were actually founded as Roman camps. Another region which they just did not bother to conquer was Germany because they could not get past the forest and all the people that lived in the forest. And so, you know, the German conquest ends abruptly. And they're like, you know what, these people are barbarians. They live in the forests, they live in the mountains. We don't want anything to do with them, so we're just not going to deal with them. Hmm, there you go. That's, yeah. <clears throat> That's Hadrian's Wall. Great place for a walking tour between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Mark just did that last summer. And then, you know, as all great empires, they begin to lose control over these large, illustrious cities that they've built everywhere in the world. And soon enough, Rome collapses. The remainder of that empire becomes the Byzantine Empire. And then history progresses. OK, how do I?
Again, we look at other examples of Roman cities. This is the city of Como in Italy. Wall, Cardo, De Comanos, main public structures located along it. Here we can see the Duomo or the cathedral in the middle. A plan of Timgad, again, very clear organizational strategy. The plan versus the photo. Mm -hmm. Florence. And who can come up to the board and outline to me what the Roman city of Florence is? Jackie? No? Try. Someone. Can you see it? Who sees it and who doesn't? Go. You see it? Come on up. Come on, Come on down. I'm going to be totally wrong. That's OK. All right, well, the first thing I saw was this. OK. What's the second thing you see? Um, I see this like center grid. Go ahead. So you were right about this. Hey. So this is the ancient Roman Yay. city of Florence. Thank you. Okay, what's the next wall? Let's get the next contestant up here. Oh, okay. So there's a series of four or five walls? Four walls. It goes on forever. Yeah. Go ahead, Jackie. Okay. By the way, you're allowed to get this wrong. That's part of learning. Is this the next wall? Uh-huh. <laughs> Look at <laughs> keep, keep going. Where are you going to draw? Is it in here or here? Whichever one. Take it. If you're going to defend this town. I will say, yeah. Yeah. Let oh, yeah. And. Let's see how she did. Survey says. She's right. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> see how. Isn't, isn't this cool? Okay, who's next? <laughs> who's next? Who came late? <laughs> We're going to remember that you are here because you stood up and you did this. <laughs> no, you can, you can see it. <coughs> you can help them and from it's the not, audience. It's not the one of DS2. There's one no, that's, before that. There's Sorry. one before that. That's oh, the latest. Okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. I don't know where it goes after. Definitely starts like that. Follow the street. Just come down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that train station sort of bisected. Okay, man. Yeah, yeah, it was harder, right? So mm. this is jumped in. Yeah. Thank you. And then there's this one. Notice this one. It goes across the river. Because the sequence is you build a wall and you tax people to come in. So people who are cheapskates don't want to come in. They settle outside the wall. They've taken their chances. But then they become important sources of income. Uh, they become, they played more and more important roles uh, in the city. And mm -hmm. so they get political power. So the wall gets extended to enclose them as well. And then you repeat the process. So just, it's the same sequence we saw in Rome. Um, with a series of walls, and now we could pick it out. You could go to almost any European city, any city that was part of this Roman system, and uh, do the same thing. For example, mm -hmm. this city, which I can't remember what it is. is Cologne. That Cologne? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we could do the same thing, but maybe we should. Yeah, we should. Move along. But again, Core, and then all of these avenues are the different walls that were built. And the fields of fire that we saw in Vienna. Mm. Um, the, here it becomes a public park when they, when they take out the wall. But again, with this idea of the road, there's this idea again of regularizing the landscape and creating an overarching sort of pattern. So here we have the Roman road that is spanning in central Italy going through the city of Bologna. And then from that, you have all of these agricultural divisions of land that also follow this very gridded system. And this is what's actually going to introduce us into the next part of our lecture, which is going to be given by Robert. Well, if we can go back one. Yeah. 
So the Roman system, I can. Okay. Uh, the Roman system, as uh, as was said, the Romans. Once you establish a street, uh, there's so many connections that you should be making here because we've studied all of these principles previously. Remember the fire in London in 1666? It wiped out. Uh, the center part of London, and then there were all these grand plans to remake it as a Beaux-Arts kind of axial uh, city, the way Pope Sixtus V did in Rome, but they couldn't do it because the roads, uh, the, the street network was so embedded in the ground that they more or less kept that the same. Well, the same is true uh, ever since the Romans established their grids if you fly over Italy, um, what you see here is uh, an agricultural pattern that was established uh, 2,000 years earlier uh, that just will never go away. So it's always there. And you see this repeated over and over again throughout history. Uh, the, uh, if you go to the city of Hanoi, you will find uh, these houses called tube houses that are only six feet wide in some places because that's the pattern that was established by the agricultural system for these six feet wide but 300 feet long agricultural plots along roadways and waterways and that is now the basis of the housing typology because it went from agricultural use to urban use um, for keeping the same grid. Uh, one of the things to point out, and the, the lecture is going to take a, a turn towards economics and power and control uh, here. One of the things that drove the Roman system that allowed them, to, that was the secret to this expansion, was not that the Roman population, it wasn't a Roman population boom and you had to do something with all these people. It was more an economic pyramid system where um, you you enslave a group, you conquer a, a place, you enslave the people, uh, you make soldiers out of them, and you send them off and you say, listen, if you conquer the next group of people, you can uh, take the wealth off the land, uh, establish a camp that then can become a city, as long as you uh, keep the taxes flowing to Rome, you can exploit the local landscape and the local people. You can enslave them. And so it was like, uh, it's a bummer to be a slave, but, uh, but not so bad to be a slave. Then you become a soldier, a centurion, literally someone who establishes the grid. Basically, the soldiers were land surveyors. The reason you survey the land is to conquer the land and the people on the land. Uh, take the land and the people, extract wealth from them into the local town that you've established and bring that back to Rome. So it's a pyramid <coughs> scheme. It's a chain letter, right? You've, you've heard of that, Bernie Madoff? So it's a machine for generating wealth and for moving wealth from the periphery to the center. And uh, the grid is a system that works very well to do that. And we saw, well, so what we're seeing is we're seeing the Phoenicians and the Greeks establishing a system of colonies uh, that were connected by water to their capitals as a way to trade. Uh, but then uh, that worked so well, the Romans take it up, they establish these gridded towns, uh, but the grid doesn't stop at the town wall, the grid continues beyond the town wall. And this became an extremely powerful system for extending um, power. Uh, and part of the, just to get back to this point, well, I guess it can be made here. Part of the uh, power of this is that um, these local communities that were being visited by the, the Roman troops uh, were clearly not organized enough to assert themselves on the landscape. And so the, the Roman grid was not just uh, this machine for exploitation, but it was also this spiritual, uh, civil, civilizational 
demonstration of power. Uh, before the Romans show up, our village was subject to the forces of nature. We followed our, our pathways and our, uh, our constructions, our architecture followed the forces of nature and, uh, and deferred to the forces of nature. But once the Romans come, they say, nature, smature. I'm not sure how that translates into whatever languages they were speaking. But uh, they were basically saying, we are Rome, we are civilized, we are a force to be reckoned with. We don't defer to the forces of nature. We impose our system and we conquer nature and we conquer the peoples. And it was a clear demonstration of power. Uh, and so that was part of the basis of the civilizing mission was that uh, they are clearly uh, if you have any question whether or not they deserve to rule, whether they deserve to have power, just look at what they built. It's a very clear demonstration of their authority and their right to wield power. And one of the connections you could make at this point is back to the very first lecture when we were looking at Medellin, Colombia and Mayor Sergio Fajardo where uh, he was using the library parks to demonstrate how serious he was about social transformation uh, to bring up the most impoverished citizens. It was an architectural demonstration of power. We're still looking at architectural demonstrations of power. Um, and this happened when we get to North America. So it's uh, if you look at this slide, you see the aerial photograph, and then you see the grid system of the map. And this carefully crafted slide shows you the same thing. You see Los Angeles, which in a way begins out like Athens. There's an Acropolis, which we saw in LA school, where Frank Gehry's concert hall is. It's at the top of the Acropolis in Los Angeles. They start out like Rome with this extremely localized uh, uh, adjustment for the forces of nature, but then on top of it, the um, 1796 Jeffersonian land uh, ordinance system is imposed on top of it, and so you get the grid of Los Angeles uh, that has to be reconciled with the city of Los Angeles prior to the establishment of the grid, and that grid goes back all the way across the continent uh, in the view that is familiar from anyone who's flown over the United States. And so we saw this before. Uh, we see um, the Manhattan grid uh, established um, very early on, long before. And it's a similar situation where the earliest Dutch settlement uh, at the tip of Manhattan suddenly gets has to be reconciled with this more standardized grid that uh, conquers the rest of the island, uh, smoothing out the bumps and the gullies uh, with cut and fill, and uh, uh, making it safe for land uh, commodification. So you could buy a piece of land anywhere on this grid, a piece of property, because it was the same as any other. You wouldn't have to go visit it. You could be in an office downtown and say, I have a lot for sale here. It's 25 feet by 100 feet. You don't even have to say that because everyone knows how big a lot is in New York. It's 25 feet by 100 feet. Um, and every lot is the same as every other lot. So there's no need to go visit it. And there's no need to design a special building to fit the site. There's no site forces. There's no site analysis required. It's a cookie cutter situation. Uh, there was a very, throughout this uh, entire history of architecture, especially when we start looking at cities, there are relationships between urban grids and the architecture of housing. And this is one of the things that we used to teach very well at Wentworth. But when we started the graduate program, we had to squeeze everything down into the undergraduate program, and the housing studio got squeezed out. So if you're taking notes on what parts of your education are missing 
from a proper four-year architecture degree. This belongs at or near the top of your list, housing. Um, and so with apologies, we're glancing across it, but it's something you might want to look into um, when you get a chance on your own to complete your otherwise incomplete education. Um, so we get, we've seen this before, we don't have to dwell on it. Uh, the system uh, of the land ordinance, uh, it's a very specific system that uh, we've looked at this enough, right? But it, it, it's interesting to note how, uh, if you look down here, uh, it, you take it down from the scale of the continent of the United States down to the six mile by six mile township, down to the uh, one mile by one mile uh, square, and then support, um, subdividing that one mile by one mile square further, we get to uh, the back 40. You know that, you've heard that term? I'm going out to the back 40. That means the 40 acres of land out back, um, I need to go 10 to the back 40 acres. There's the, this is the 40 acre uh, square here. And it goes all the way down to a block where you start to develop housing prototypes, housing types that fit well into the squares that are the American landscape beyond the Appalachian Mountains. And so um, you'll see these images that Ali has collected um, just showing the different ways that architects and developers have reconciled housing typologies with these squares that are produced by the land ordinance system of the U.S. continent. And you see here um, the Radburn, New Jersey Garden City uh, idea, but now it's, it's being manifest. Um, we, we're not good at doing it for children, but old white men with lots of money who like to play golf, we can do it for them. Or you could also see it in Florida, um, old white men with uh, big boats. Uh, there's, a, there's a way to create water channels to maximize the value of your real estate. Uh, I need a car out front and a boat out back. And so uh, Florida real estate is really good it's satisfying that market demand using a fractal geometry strategy that comes straight out of Radburn, New Jersey, the Garden City that we looked at before. So we've seen this. Uh, we look at um, um, how this system was established. An army of surveyors are sent across the continent. Uh, they're sighting on uh, Pikes Peak in Colorado, and they're, it's all based on sight lines. I used to live on a road, uh, near a road in Boulder, Colorado called Baseline Drive. It's because it was one of these baselines used in the survey. Um, and then one of my favorite phenomena that responds to the question at the beginning of the lecture, when is a map more than just a record of the territory? When it is the driver of the design of the territory. And here you see this ludicrous uh, situation that uh, at the cost of many hundreds of lives every year when people are surprised by these turns. Um, but what you're going to do, we have a land ordinance system. We're not going to deviate uh, from the land ordinance grid uh, just to save a few lives. That would uh, take away valuable farmland out of this corner if we softened the, the sharpness of that turn. And so um, in the reading, we saw what happens when uh, the Europeans coming from the East Coast are moving west as part of what you studied in middle school, Manifest Destiny. Remember that? Um, it is our white European destiny to conquer this entire continent from sea to shining sea. And um, the only thing in the way is distance itself, oh yeah, plus the hundreds of First Nations that already exist on the land. Um, hunting buffalo uh, in a way that it is in balance so that the herb, the, the numbers um, 
the herd numbers don't decline from season to season. Um, uh, but an amazing machine for producing buffalo resources, where you use everything, the hide, the flesh, uh, you just, it's all part of uh, a balanced, a more balanced system. It wasn't completely balanced. Um, for example, they would drive the buffalo off a cliff to kill them all, um, but that was highly unsustainable. Could I borrow your power? I don't know why it's suddenly. Um, but you see, uh, 19th the forces of nature uh, as romantically looking at the forces of nature, but at the same time, you conquer them and wipe them out, both in the terms of the First Nations and uh, the buffalo herds. And here's one of my favorite images um, of the lecture where it's got everything. It's got misogynist representation of women. Uh, <clears throat> it's got New York Harbor over here on this part of the screen. Can you see my little arrow when I do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh good, because I don't want to stand up. Um, you see the farmers uh, clearing the land. Uh, you see the goddess <laughs> Athena carrying civilization in the form of the book. Um, her garments are about to slip away. Um, the telegraph cables are being strung across the continent along the railway lines. The stagecoach um, is coming behind the, uh, the frontier covered wagons. These pioneers heading across the landscape ready to conquer it with pickaxe and shovel, driving back the savages. Uh, the darkness on the left is not a mistake. Um, it's very, the light from the east is moving across to the west. There's no question about which way north is in this image. Uh, the savages are being driven. You can even see San Francisco Bay over here. Um, it's just a, a remarkable encapsulation of the powerful attitudes of the age of the 19th century that the, represents these forces that drove uh, these, the, this transformation of the North American landscape. Um, it was a hunting uh, and gathering kind of, or hunting and tra a fur trapping economy that then became uh, a lumber economy. Uh, lumber was needed for the fences uh, the civilizing mission uh, was seen here with the bringing of the Wurlitzer organ uh, for the church uh, in the new settlement territories. Uh, uh, lumber was in extremely short supply, so some of the uh, buildings were built out of sod, so earth structures. Um, now, here's uh, one of the really great points of the reading, uh, the Cronin uh, reading of Nature's Metropolis, is he makes the point that if we were looking at the natural transportation uh, opportunities of the expansion across the continent, we'd be looking at St. Louis as the import, most important node of transportation because that's where the confluence of the um, Ohio and Mississippi rivers, uh, which would give you water access throughout the continent. And you will recall, we talked about the physics of water. Remember that? Uh, water is a fantastic way to transport goods, because uh, how could you use the least amount of energy to transport a ton of something very heavy like lumber, or wheat, or coal, or meat? As, as we see later in, the, in this. Um, you float it on the water. It, uh, the, a ton of wheat will go on a barge and sink the barge until one ton of water is displaced. And then it'll stop sinking. And then you could move that with one mule. So the most efficient way to overcome the friction of distance is by water. And so the Erie Canal becomes something that the investors of New York and Boston on the East Coast uh, 
they, they win this battle. They create the Erie Canal at great expense to create a water linkage from the Hudson River to the Great Lakes. And using the Great Lakes to float heavy materials, they get uh, to Chicago. So the reason uh, the Erie Canal, the reason Chicago wins the battle for supremacy over St. Louis is because the investors in New York City said, we need, we need New York City to be, to be the center of, of flow of goods from the West, not Baltimore, not Philadelphia, uh, not these southern East Coast ports. We need New York to be it. And so um, using a system of locks where they raise boats uh, in small increments, uh, they go across the, New, the Empire State of New York. Um, New York becomes the Empire State because of the empire built, uh, not unlike the Roman operating system. Uh, the canal operating system establishes all these towns across upstate New York, Utica, Rochester, uh, Syracuse, one after another, um, buff uh, leading to Buffalo. You may not have even heard of Buffalo, but at one time, it was destined to be the second largest state, uh, city in the United States because it was where the Erie Canal connected with the Great Lakes. Here we see the barges loaded up, uh, loaded as much as you want. It will carry as much tonnage, and still one or two mules will pull all that weight down the paths. So a remarkable system. Um, why Chicago? Uh, Cronin goes on at length uh, on the parts of the book that uh, were not part of your reading to say that um, uh, it's easy to forget the question of why Chicago because when you look back at things in history, it seems like, well, of course, George W. Bush was president of the United States. It was inevitable that he was going to win that election. Of course, uh, Napoleon was defeated. Uh, in the Battle of Waterloo, of course. Well, in the rearview mirror, history takes on a sense of inevitability. But at the moment, there was, it was highly unlikely that uh, George W. Bush was going to be president. It was just a judge in Florida that made the difference. It was highly unlikely that Donald Trump was ever going to be president. It was a few very localized forces that turned that outcome around. And similarly with Chicago. We think of these things, maybe Trump election is something you experienced yourselves um, as being highly unlikely. Chicago was similarly highly unlikely. It should have been St. Louis. Everybody knew it should have been St. Louis. But because of the intervention, uh, the meddling, some would say, of the New York investors, uh, this tiny little stagnant creek on the southwest corner of Lake Michigan became the site of the most important urban system, the node, the most important node in this vast urban system uh, that is uh, the machine for harvesting the wealth of the Midwest through Chicago, through uh, the, the port cities of the East Coast. And so um, we look at Chicago, 19, uh, 1835, and these land speculators put a grid down, and they said, want to buy some land? And they weren't saying it to people who were in Chicago. They were saying it to people who were in Boston, New York, Philadelphia. They were selling land in Chicago to investors on the East Coast, and the only way they were able to do that is because of the grid. Because every parcel, every block is identical to every other parcel, every other block. What history doesn't tell us, and Cronin, until Cronin points it out, is that uh, yes, Chicago did that, but so did several dozen other uh, places on Lake Michigan where uh, there was a creek, a similar creek. So all up and down the coast, uh, the west coast of Lake Michigan, there were towns saying, we're going to be the hub of commerce uh, through the West. And people bought land in all of these towns uh, while people were buying land in the town of Chicago. Now, at this point, 
there's lots of connections to be made to other things we've talked about. One of the benefits of teaching the course backwards is you can say, oh yeah, Dubai. What's the um, value of land in Dubai? Well, it depends on um, the story that you're telling. So this is um, a very quick uh, unit on land economics. The basic theory of land economics is that the closer you are to the center of the city, the more valuable the land is because that's the population center. Um, it probably started out as a trading post and then a village and then a town and then eventually it becomes a city. There are enough people there that uh, that's the place where people want to be because that's the point of exchange. So that's where the land value is highest. You can't afford to grow corn in the center of the city because the land is too valuable. You can't afford, uh, you can't sell corn competitive, at a competitive price uh, because uh, the land is so valuable. And so to find the place where you grow corn, you have to go out and find a place where the commodity value of a bushel of corn will allow you to grow corn on cheap enough land to, to be profitable. And so you go out to here. Um, let's see, crop rotation, enclosed fields. So you grow corn out in this range. You don't grow corn any further in because you can't compete. And this is the von Thunen model of uh, economic land value. And um, as soon as you internalize that, I want you to uh, now disrupt it because this is not how most cities look today because this nice, neat, concentric circle, as long as you get the concept, it is immediately disrupted by things like rivers. Because you have transportation, all of a sudden, it's not a point, it becomes a line. And so the city, uh, the place of high value, becomes this place of transportation. So every piece of transportation infrastructure alt and alters and distorts the nice, neat, concentric rings of this land economic model. Um, and we see that at play at this separate thing. You can look at this at the scale of a city. You can also look at it at the scale of the United States, where if the assumption here, it's too small to read, but the assumption here is that New York City is not just the largest market for everything, it's the only market. So if New York City is the only market for buying and selling things, then you can afford to grow vegetables uh, in this ring, but no further, because you have to, they have to stay fresh. Um, you can get a certain price, and it has to stay fresh, so that's where you grow vegetables. Here's the dairy ring, here's the cotton and tobacco ring, here's the um, corn and soybean ring, here's the wheat ring, beef cattle, and then forest. But this immediately, this nice, neat, concentric circle economic arrangement of this model is immediately distorted by climate. So if you can't do, if you, as soon as you start to take into consideration topography and climate, this, the nice, neat pattern here gets disrupted. And now again, thinking of Dubai, uh, on this scale, Dubai is beyond even this. Dubai is probably the least valuable place conceivable on the planet because it's a desert. There's nothing there. There's not even uh, water. Uh, but by distorting it with real estate ideas, a port, an airline, uh, the tallest building in the world, those have emerged as architectural strategies for distorting the economic model of land value so extremely that Dubai is a thing that we've heard of. If this model were to hold true, we would have never heard of this tiny little pearl diving fishing village uh, at the edge of the desert um, because it's no place like the thousands of other no places. So it's a very powerful uh, demonstration of how architecture operates to transform the territory. Back to that original question of the lecture. Uh, to add something to what you were saying, not just architecture, but infrastructure and the creation of the <coughs> network. 
the Romans pioneered their empire with the creation of this road network, the same way that Chicago pioneered its growth by essentially the growth of the railroad around it and these connections. The same, Dubai is doing essentially the same thing. The only difference is that Dubai is using airplanes. Wherever you fly around the world, you have to do a layover in Dubai now because they're creating these hinterlands, global hinterlands and connections. And so here we see a, a computer-generated data visualization of the distortion of these values uh, around Chicago. Um, the lumber, and we're going to have to move quickly. Balloon framing, the fire, the land rush. Uh, Oklahoma was kept off the land market because it was the one remaining corner of the continent for the First Nations peoples. Uh, but then, nah, never mind, we take it back, move to, move to the desert, and we're going to take over. So in, a, in, a, in a 1862, they fire the gun, and off everyone goes to claim as much land as they can. Um, and that's how we civilized the North American continent. Um, we think of it this way, but it really is through the rail system. Um, at one point in history, one quarter of the railways in the world passed through Chicago. Um, and the way, how did you pay for all this? It's similar to the Roman system. Uh, the, uh, I'm not sure they realized they were repeating what the Romans did, but the U.S. government granted all the land uh, along the railway routes uh, for uh, several I don't know, it's at 50 miles, to the north and south of the route of the railway, they gave that land to the railway companies. By gridding that land off and selling it to investors back on the East Coast, they raised the money to build the railway, which was a very expensive undertaking. But it more than paid for itself because as soon as you take away this land from the First Nations and you... Uh, parcelize it and you build towns and you put a railway nearby, all of a sudden that land is connected with a global market passing through Chicago. The telegraph followed. Um, this is the final point of the lecture. And this um, refers back to what was said in the reading about first nature and second nature. We continue to this day and I know it because I talk with your colleagues in studio, have this fantasy of nature. That there is a thing, there is a place that is natural. It turns out there is not a single location on the surface of the planet Earth that retains its natural state. Every square inch of the planet has been irrevocably altered by the presence of humans. There is no nature. There are natural forces that continue to operate, but there is no natural place. Every place has been disrupted by second nature. Yes? Well, what about the areas where we haven't um, ventured to, like deep down in the ocean, where a mankind hasn't developed a technology Pollution. to? Pollution. Ah. I saw a Pollution, documentary. It was like it? one of the last places on Earth that man had Plastic has permeated every bit of air and water Damn. on the planet. You'd have to dig a hole very deep before you find something unaltered. So the, the corollary to that is that, uh, is that um, also students believe that before you build the building, there is a nice green lawn uh, about one and a half inch high, and that's the site. The planet is covered with lawn until you come in and put an object building in the center of it. It's just not the way it works. Um, the, where does the architecture end? It might be in sophomore studio, you were led to believe that architecture ends where the air conditioning ends. But hopefully by now you've uh, encountered in studio that the architecture has left the building. The architecture extends way beyond the air conditioning boundary. The architecture extends across the landscape. And I'm, this lecture 
this final point is that the architecture has extended beyond the boundary of, of air conditioning, past the parcel boundary, into the urban systems, out of the city, across the continent, and uh, it is a continuous system. It is a continuous system of architecture, urbanism, and landscape that extends from the toilet to from sea to shining sea. And part of it you can see in the grid. It's a system of grids. It's a horizontal grid and it's a vertical grid. The way we uh, take control, the way we assert authority, the way we seize power is through the natural, the, the very powerful system of self-reproduction that is the grid. When Chicago burned, we rebuilt it. Um, and to understand the city as it is, uh, is to understand this strategy, this architectural strategy of self-reproduction that is inherent in the grid. Uh, it used to be that a cow would be brought to a butcher shop, butchered, and you'd have meat for all your customers for a week. Well, because that is results in expensive beef, uh, the logic of mass production uh, brought us to the point where now we have feedlots. We have mechanized beef production. Uh, because of ice uh, harvesting off of the lakes outside of Chicago, we can refrigerate the cars. We created uh, a grid of uh, meat production that resulted in this massive architectural intervention of the Union stockyards in Chicago. It was too expensive to march the cows to Chicago because the cows would lose their weight. They would lose weight. And so the cowboy cattle drives went away. Instead, we put the cattle on railroad cars because the, the value of the meat weight that they would lose on the march to Chicago is greater than the cost of the coal to burn to get those cattle using fossil fuels. And so we start shipping, we drive the cattle to uh, the different towns that have railway uh, terminals. We put the cows in cars, we bring them to Chicago, and we slaughter them. We even use the weight of the animal to power the factory. So we, the, the pig would march to the top of the slaughterhouse, get hoisted on the wheel, um, and so the input for the energy is uh, from the animal calorie. You, you invest a little bit of that calorie value in getting the pig to the top floor of the building. You hang it from the wheel, you slit its throat, the weight of the, anim the dead animal or dying animal drives the machinery and um, then you civilize the whole thing with an architectural gate, becomes one of the greatest uh, tourist destinations after the uh, World Columbian Exposition of 1893, which we saw in a previous lecture. The Union Stockyards is a much, uh, it's a, it's a must-see, a must-smell, a horrific grid of meat production. Um, and that's all we have time for. Questions? Oh, we have 10 minutes, plenty of time. Um, so the point here is um, really these last three lectures, uh, the city as an organism, the city as a machine, and the city as a cosmos, are a way to reflect back on everything else we've talked about in this course, from Medellin to Dubai to uh, your experiences here in Boston to the automobile, to the Garden City, Radiant City, uh, the City Beautiful movement. All of these things are resonating through these last three lectures. That everything we see in urban form uh, through your analysis projects falls, uh, falls in, one of the working theories of the course is everything you're looking at in cities falls into more or less these three categories. Things that emerge as the outcome of these large forces, uh, like we saw exemplified by the uh, operating system, the Islamic operating system, has a certain set of rules and practices that generate a very specific set of relationships that you can read in the patterns of urban formation that 
prior to this understanding, you would have thought as complete chaos, like the informal settlements. By the way, the informal settlements themselves, we have several thesis students right now decoding the chaos that is the informal settlements and identifying operating rules of the informal settlement operating system of Latin America. It's a very interesting process, a very direct extension of what we're doing in this course. Um, similarly, you see in this lecture how the grid throughout history has uh, provided an extremely powerful strategy, an architectural strategy, for self-reproduction of systems of control. That uh, the Greeks and the Phoenicians did it, the Romans did it. Uh, we could uh, teach a whole course on just this theme and go into the hundreds of other distinct uh, social, historical, civilizing mission type operations. Colonialism was a giant system of gridding, as we saw when we talked about Amsterdam and Batavia. Um, it is an extremely powerful strategy for extending and as self producing a self reproducing system. So we're looking at architectural forces uh, as a system. We're taking a systems approach to an understanding of the forces of the world and how architecture is a produces all these strategies and formal methods for uh, extending the power of these strategies for either good or evil. Um, so that's, and the last one is going to be next week, where we look at spiritual religious forces from the earliest uh, urban formations and how they operate uh, through architectural strategies at every scale, from the scale of a room uh, to the scale of large regional landscapes. Questions? Connections? Do you, do you see connections from this theme back to other things that we talked about in the course? Uh, anyone want to contest the notion that there is no more nature? There's only natural forces. There may be lots of natural forces still operating, um, some that are destined to reduce the population of multiple species, including humans, um, but there is no more nature. Uh, it's well. Is it dangerous outside of Chicago to the west of Chicago? If to the extent that it's not dangerous to go out there, and it's not, everybody's lovely. It's because, in part, to the power and success of the grid. If you get in trouble out there, uh, find a road. People going by waved to me when I was riding my motorcycle across the country, the times I hitchhiked across the country. I was fearful of people being hostile to me, this teenager with long hair. Um, no problem. They were so friendly. Uh, the, uh, and, if you, uh, and then go to a town. As long as you're white, you're fine. Towns, towns are empty. It's a very, it's a very scary feeling. But uh, when you start talking to people, even if you're not white, once you start talking to people, uh, it's, it, you can reach them. They'll say you're not white, but you're not so bad, <laughs> right? They'll start to. My parents were, were lifelong racist, so I witness it that way, that um, uh, they, they, they would accept people not like themselves. Uh, they would restructure their brains that, yes, my, my lifelong beliefs and commitment to racism is undisturbed. 
this person is special. It's the, this person is the exception to the rule. So that's my experience out there in the vast gridded landscape of North America. It's not so bad. They get TV. They get the internet. So in a way, uh, the sense of difference is left over from the 20th century. That difference increasingly disappears. It is difficult to find someone who doesn't have an American accent that sounds like my American accent. It's increasingly difficult. In a way, it started out as uh, very different locations, but increasingly, the entire continent is a single city, which is kind of the punchline of the lecture. It used to be lots of different cities connected by a grid, mm -hmm. but now the grid is uh, uh, in orbit around the planet, connecting us through our uh, road, or what used to be the road infrastructure, the telegraph, the telephone. We still call it the telephone, but it's not a telephone. Who makes calls on this thing? This is, it could just as easily be called the grid. We are all on the grid of a single North American city. This is one big city now because we can talk to whoever we want instantaneously. Uh, it's easier than walking out the door and going to my neighbor's house. Yeah. If nothing is natural anymore, can you say that everything is natural? In a sense, if I look at an ant farm on an ant hill, and I see, I see a colony. And I look at an apartment building, and it's the same thing. It's a colony. Or a, a beaver, beaver dam is just it's a building built by something that's not human. But I like that. How do you guys, what do you guys think? Everything's natural. Everything's natural. <laughs> the one place where I would be very careful is when we're talking about things that are the operation of uh, power, uh, especially economic power. We think it's natural that there are great divisions between the wealthy and the impoverished. It seems natural. Society has operated to naturalize that condition. But if you look at it historically, uh, there have always been divisions between great wealth and great poverty, but there has never before been this huge acceleration, this, concept, this big rushing, wishing sound of wealth up the grid to the wealthiest 1%. There's, if, if people are telling you that that's a natural thing, you should, red flags and alarm bells should go off. It's not natural. It's the result of systemic design forces and the toleration of lots of people of something that is not natural. OK? So come talk to us to set up a meeting time. If your group has submitted uh, a draft version of your